chapter eight. Here we go. Get ready. It's a short one. This last one was literally an hour. I already know that the camp. I already know the camp on the moors. It was here that Hamlet saw his gates. He got in his education. But now I know hardly anyone here. As ever, all is altered. There are only a few people that I have occasionally met before. I go through the routine mechanically. In the evenings, I generally go to the soldier's home where the newspapers are laid out. I do not read them. Still, there is a piano there that I am glad enough to play on. Two girls are in attendance. One of them is young. The camp is surrounded with high barbed wire fences. If we come back late from the soldier's home, we have to, do, we have to show passes. Those who are on good terms with the guard can get through, of course. Among the junipers and the birch trees and the moor, we practice company drill each day. It is very well if one expects something better. We advance in a run, fling ourselves down, and our panting breath booms the stalks of the grasses and the flowers of the heather to and fro. Looked at so closely, one sees the fine sand is composed, composed of millions of the tiniest pebbles, as clear as if they had been made in a laboratory. It is strangely inviting to dig one's hand into it. The most beautiful are the woods with their lines of birch trees. Their color changes with every minute and the stems gleam purest white, and between them, airy and silken, hangs the pastel grain of the leaves. The next moment, all changes to an opalescent blue, as the shivering breezes pass down from the heights and touch the green lightly sway, and again in one place, it deepens almost to black as a cloud passes over the sun, and the shadow moves like a ghost through the dim trunks and rides far out over the moor to the sky. The birches stand out again like gay banners on white poles with their red and gold patches of autumn-tinted leaves. I often become so lost in the play of soft light and transparent shadow that I almost fail to hear the commands. As when one is alone that one begins to observe nature and to love her. Here I have not much companionship and do not even desire it. We are too little acquainted with one another to do more than joke a bit and play poker or nap in the evening. He's at this camp. He has to learn some new drills, right? And he's going to stay here for a few weeks before he goes back up to the front with his friends. Alongside our camp is the big Russian prison camp. It is separated from us by a wire fence, but in spite of this, the prisoners come across to us. They seem nervous and fearful, but most of them are big fellows with beards. They look like meek, scolded St. Bernard dogs. They slink about our camp and pick over the garbage tins. One can imagine what they find there. With us, food is pretty scarce and none too good at that. Turnips cut up into six pieces and boiled in water, and unwashed carrot tops. Moldy potatoes are tidbits, and the chief luxury the thin rice soup in which fold little bits of beef, you know. These are cut up so small that they take a lot of finding. Everything gets eaten, notwithstanding, and if ever anyone is so well off as to not want all his share, there are a dozen others standing by ready to relieve him of it. Only the dregs that the ladle cannot reach are tipped out and thrown into the garbage tins. Along with that, there are sometimes to go there are sometimes go a few turnip peelings, moldy bread crusts, and all kinds of muck. This thin, miserable, dirty garbage is the objective of the prisoners pick it out of the shaking, stinking tins greedily and go off with it under their blouses. It is strange to see these enemies of ours so close up. They have faces that make one think. Honest pleasant faces, broad foreheads, broad noses, broad mouths, broad hands, and thick hair. They have to be put to threshing, reaping, and apple picking. Look just as kindly as their own peasants in Friesland. So he's at this camp, and then we'll be boarding his camp as the prisoner of war camp, so POWs. Okay, so these are the Russian prisoners of war that they have been captured on the battlefield and they're placed in this camp and they have to be treated fairly until the war is over and they get returned back to the Russian side. And they don't have much to eat, right? So they literally, so at Paul's camp where the Germans are, where they're doing their drills and they're learning army techniques, whatever he's really doing, right? They eat and then they throw their garbage or they throw kind of like the least appetizing remains into a bin and they give the bin to the Russians and say here have at it take just like pick out our scraps because we're not really going to feed you very well okay it's distressing to watch their movements to see them begging for something to eat they're all rather feeble so they only get enough nourishment to keep them from starving ourselves we have not had sufficient to eat for long enough they have dysentery furtively many of them display the blood-stained tails of their shirts their backs, their necks are bent, their knees sag, their heads droop as they stretch out of their hands and beg in the few words of German that they know. They have with those soft, deep, musical voices that are like warm stoves and cozy rooms at home. Some men there are who give them a kick so that they fall over, but those are not many. The majority do nothing to them, just ignore them. Um, occasionally when they are too groveling, it makes a man mad when he kicks them. 
if one only what they would not look at one so what great misery can be in two such small spots no bigger than a man's thumb in their eyes so what's happening is these Russians are literally begging these Germans, like, here, can you give us some food? Can you spare a blanket, clothing, anything you have? And the Germans get so mad at how pitiful that these prisoners of war look like that they want, like, they try to beat them up, or they kick them over, or they ignore them. They come over to the camp in the evenings and trade. They exchange whatever they possess for bread. Often they have fair success because they have very good boobs and ours are bad. The leather of their knee boots is wonderfully soft, like suede. The peasants among us who get tidbits sent from home can afford to trade. The price of a pair of boots is about two or three loaves of army bread, or a loaf of bread and a small, tough ham sausage. But most of the Russians have long since parted with whatever things they had. Now they wear only the most pitiful clothing, and try to exchange little carvings and objects that they had made out of the shell fragments of copper driving bands. Of course, they don't get much for these such things, although they may have taken immense pains with them. They go for a slice or two of bread. Our presents are hard and cunning when they bargain. They hold the piece of bread or sausage right under the nose of the Russian until he grows pale with greed and his eyes bulge and they will give anything for it. The peasants wrap up their booty with the utmost solemnity and they get out their big pocket knives and slowly and deliberately cut off a slice of bread for themselves from their supply. With every mouthful, take a piece of the good tough sausage to reward themselves with a good feed. It's distressing to watch them take their afternoon meal thus. One would like to crack them over their thick pates. They rarely give anything away. How little we understand one another. I am often on guard over the Russians. In the darkness, one sees their forms move like six storks, like big, like great birds. They come up close to the wire fence, lean their faces against it. Their fingers hook around the mesh. Often, many stand side by side and breathe the wind that comes down from the moors in the forest. They really speak, and then only a few words. They are more human and more brotherly towards one another, it seems to me, than we are. But perhaps it is merely because they feel themselves to be more unfortunate than us. Anyway, the war is over so far as they are concerned. But to wait for dysentery is not much of a life either. The territorials who are in charge of them say that they were much more lively at first. They have used to have intrigues among themselves, as always happens, who would often come to blows and knives. Now they are quite apathetic and listless. Most of them do not masturbate anymore, so they are so feeble, though otherwise things come to such a pass that whole huts full of them do it. It's nice. They stand at a wire fence. Sometimes one goes away, and then another at once takes his place in line. Most of them are silent. Occasionally one begs a cigarette butt. I see their dark forms, their beards move in the wind. I know nothing of them except that they are prisoners. That is exactly what troubles me. Their life is obscure and guiltless. If I know more if I can know more of them, what their names are, how they live, what they are waiting for, what their burdens are, my emotion would have an object, it might become sympathy. But as it is, I perceive behind them only the suffering of the creature, the awful melancholy of life, and the pitilesslessness of men. A word of command has made these silent figures our enemies. A word of command might transform them into our friends. At some table, a document is signed by some persons whom none of us knows, and for years together, that very crime in which formerly the world's condemnation and severest penalty fall becomes our highest aim. Who can draw such a distinction when he looks at these quiet men with their childlike faces and apostle beards? Any non-commissioned officer is more of an enemy to a recruit, any schoolmaster to a pupil, than they are to us. And yet we would shoot at them again, and add they at us if they were free. I am frightened. I dare think of this way no more. This way lies the abyss. It is now, not now, the time that I will not lose these thoughts. I will keep them, shut them away until the war is ended. My heart beats fast. This is the aim, the great, the sole aim that I have thought of in the trenches. I have looked for as the only possibility of existence after this annihilation of all human feeling. This is the task that will make life off afterwards worthy of these hideous years. I take out my cigarettes, break each one in half, and give them to the Russians. They bow to me and then light the cigarettes. Now red points glow in every face. They comfort me. It looks as though they were little windows in the dark village cottages, saying that behind them are rooms full of peace. So Paul's looking at these Russians, right? And he's all of a sudden thinking, like, they literally look so poor and so pitiless and so sad. He's like, who decided that they were our enemy? These men went to war, we don't know who these men are, and this direction, this directive came from the top, said, oh, the Russians are now your enemies, and I have to go and kill them. Paul just kind of, like, is thinking, like, this is so crazy, like, today they're telling us their enemies, what's not to say, like, okay, the next day they're going to they're gonna sign a document, all of a sudden they're friends again. Paul just doesn't get why he's, he, he's beginning to realize, I mean, sure, he has this whole time, but now he's letting the thoughts come to the surface that, I mean, these the people that he's ordered to kill, his enemies, just ordinary people, just like him. 
Okay, the days go by. On a foggy morning, another of the Russians is buried. Almost every day, one of them dies. I am on guard during the burial. The prisoners sing a choral. They sing in parts, and it sounds almost as if there were no voices, but an organ far away over the moor. The burial is quickly over. In the evening, they stand again at the wire fence, and the wind comes down to them from the beech woods. The stars are cold. I know. I now know a few of those who speak a little German. There is a musician amongst them. He says he used to be a violinist in Berlin. When he hears that I can play the piano, he fetches his violin and plays. The others sit down and lean their backs against the fence. He stands up and plays. Sometimes he has that absent expression which violinists get when they close their eyes, or again, he sways the instrument to the rhythm and smiles across at me. He plays mostly folk songs, and the others hum with him. They are like a country of dark hills that sink far down into the ground. The sound of the violin stands like a slender girl above it and is clear and alone. The voices cease, and the violin continues alone. In the night it is so thin it sounds frozen. One must stand close up. It would be much better in a room. I hear it makes the man grow sad. Because I've already had such a long leave, I get none on Sundays. So the last Sunday before I go back to the front, my father and eldest sister come home, come over to see me. All day we sit in the soldier's home. Where else can we go? We don't want to stay in the camp. About midday we go for a stroll on the moors. The hours are a torture. We do not know what to talk about, so we speak of my mother's illness. It is now definitely cancer. She is already in the hospital and will be operated on shortly. The doctors hope she will recover, but we have never heard of cancer being cured. Where is she then, I ask? In Louisa Hospital, says my father. In which class? Third. So like first, second, third class, like depending on your economic levels, how you get treated in the hospitals. Third class. We must wait till we know what the operation costs. She wanted to be in the third herself. She said that then she would have some company, and besides, it is cheaper. So she is lying there with all those people, if only she could sleep properly. My father nods. His face is broken and full of furrows. His mother has always been sickly, and that she has only gone to the hospital when she has been compelled to. This costs a great deal of money, and my father's life has been practically given up to it. If only I knew how much the operation costs, said he. Have you not asked? Not directly. I cannot do that. The surgeon might take it amiss, and that would not do. He must operate on mother. Yes, I think bitterly. That's how it is with us, and with all poor people. They don't air they don't dare ask the price, but worry themselves dreadfully beforehand about it. For the others, for whom it is not important, they sell the price first as a matter of course. The doctor is not taken amiss from them. The dressings afterwards are so expensive, says my father. Doesn't the invalid's fund pay for any, anything towards it then, I ask? Mother has been ill too long. Uh, have you heard? Have you had any money at all? He shakes his head. No, but I can do some overtime. I know. He will stand at his desk folding and pasting and cutting until 12 o'clock at night. At 8 o'clock in the evening, he will eat some miserable rubbish they get in exchange for their food tickets. And he will take a powder for his headache and work on. In order to cheer him up a bit, I tell him a few stories. Soldiers' jokes and the like about generals and sergeant majors. Afterwards, I accompany them both to the railway station. They give me a pot of jam and a bag of potato cakes that my mother has made for me. Then they go off and I return to the camp. In the evening, I spread the jam on the cakes and eat some. But I have no taste for them, so I go out and give them to the Russians. Then it occurs to me that my mother cooked them herself, and she was probably in pain as she stood before the hot stove. Put the bag in my pack and take only two cakes to the Russians. End of chapter 9